great to have you with us for Central Church Online this week, our second week in the book of Colossians, where last week we saw Paul starting with words which he often starts his letters with, grace and peace to you from God our Father. Uh, and that's what we would pray for all of you too, that God's grace would be upon you and that you would know his peace. I trust that's the case for you today. It's great to have you with us. My name is Scott Muir and I'm the Senior Pastor at Central Church in Ipswich. Uh, we are a church in the heart of the city of Ipswich and we have a heart for the city of Ipswich. I want to see uh, this great gospel of Jesus made known to everybody across our region. Um, and we'd ask you to be praying about that, that God would be at work in people's lives uh, so that that would happen. A very a special welcome to you. Maybe if you're not a part of our church family, we'd love you to be. And you could do that or take a step towards that by getting onto our website, centralchurch.net.au and just finding there the, uh, the connect card and you can connect with us. We'd love to uh, know who you are so we can be in touch with you and learn how we can minister most effectively um, to you. As I said, this is the second week in our Colossians series. It's just called More Than Enough. Um, and look, I don't know what your week's been like. If I'm sure it's had challenges. All of our weeks seem to have challenges, things that are hard, uh, things that worry us. We can spend a lot of time, can't we, worrying. We can spend a lot of time solving problems. We can spend a lot of time making plans and researching how to get better in certain, certain situations that we're in. We can talk about our problems with other people, but how much do we talk to God? How often do you talk to God? How many times do you bring these issues to God? Is it the first thing you do or the last thing that you do? Well, today we're going to talk about prayer. Um, we saw last week, if you were with us, that Paul starts his letters talking about it, it, that why he's thankful to God uh, for the Colossians. But today, from verses 9 to 14 of chapter 1, our emphasis is on what he prays for, for the Colossian church. Uh, we're going to get some lessons in prayer from a master prayer from Paul as we join him in prayer. So as we think about that, please pray with me now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace to us. You are a gracious God. We have received from you so much and we are undeserving. Thank you for your peace, a peace that transcends all understanding, a peace that is ours because of what Christ Jesus has done for us, not because of what we've achieved for ourselves. The Heavenly Father, we worship you and we honour you. We thank you that we can be drawn into your family and that you love us as your children. And Lord, we thank you that you long to hear us pray, that so often in Scripture we, we hear those words that you would incline your ear to us. So, Father, we pray that that would be the case today as we draw near to you, that we would know you drawing near to us. And, Father, we come to you um, confessing our sin. Here we acknowledge, Lord, that we, though striving, we want to live for you, yet so often we are far from you. So often the old ways of the old self of sin are come to the fore. Instead of living out what you have done for us, the, the newness of life that we have. So Father, we want to pray that we would live as those new creations in Christ and putting off the old, but confessing, Lord, that we don't, often, uh, don't always do that. Thank you that in Christ Jesus there's no condemnation and we stand secure in you, justified, holy saints before you, as Paul says to the Colossians. And gracious Father, we want to pray today for our church family. Thank you for uh, these people who you've put in our lives, uh, people who uh, love us, walk the journey of faith with us, who serve us in so many different ways. And Lord, especially for those youngest members of our church, today we want to pray for our, our next-gen ministries and those young people who are growing up to be followers of Jesus. Uh, Lord, we pray that they would be strengthened as they seek to follow you in a world which doesn't follow you. Help them to remain firmly uh, abiding in Christ throughout all of their lives. And Father, we pray that they might go on to be those who are the faithful leaders of your church in the future, um, prayerfully uh, taking uh, the gospel to all parts of the world. 
Lord, we pray, thank you for their leadership. Uh, Lord, from the youngest to those who are older. Uh, Lord, we do, it's especially this morning, uh, today, want to pray for uh, the young adults ministries and the leaders of the home groups there. Thank you that those home groups are, are overflowing. And we pray, Lord, that you would continue to provide the leadership that they need. Father, we pray for our youth group as it uh, commences meeting again uh, this week. We thank you for them. Uh, thank you that the young people who come and, and, and don't just sort of, sort of come for the, the fun and games, but to seriously gather around your word, to hear you speak and to grow in their knowledge and understanding of you. Lord, might they draw nearer to you each and every day. And we thank you for their leaders, Lord. Empower them and strengthen them for the, the task of leadership that you've given. Lord, we want to pray also for those in our congregation who've been unwell. Uh, for some, there's still COVID, and Lord, we pray for their recovery. We pray also for those who have other uh, health issues. Lord, be near to them, comfort them. Well, Lord, give them strength and courage to persevere uh, through the trials that they might be facing. All of this we pray in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to read from God's Word, and we're in Colossians chapter 1, starting from verse 9. We'd encourage you to have your Bibles there, and please read with me. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might, for an endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now let's just pray. Oh, gracious Father, we thank you for your word and thank you for Paul's example of prayer here. And help us to be prayerful, to be people who come to you and bring both our needs for ourselves, but for others before you. Thank you for hearing us. Teach us and equip us, we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Uh, there is a talk outline um, on our website and that link there on the screen will take you directly to it. So if you'd like to take that outline and follow along there, that might be of some use to you. We would encourage you to do so. Uh, communication. Communication is a big deal, isn't it, for, uh, for us. We have uh, lots of tools for communicating available to us today, um, probably more than ever before, and, and many of them we just carry with us right now. Uh, the constant ding of a phone is a call uh, to some form of communication. Uh, some of that is trivial, some of it's irrelevant, some of it's mundane, but some of it's really good for my heart. Like you know, when my wife sends me a photo of something she's doing with the kids while I'm at work. Or when my daughter messages me about something that's encouraged her on her way to uni. Or, or if my son actually messages me at all, that's, that's a win. That encourages my heart if I hear anything from him. I know of older people who are navigating Facebook and even Twitter because that's where they find they can connect with their grandchildren. You know, they see photos of what you know, they've made for dinner or whatever it might be, it's so good. But you, you know what I mean, connection with people that you love is really precious. And that's what prayer is, right? Prayer is a way for us to connect with our loving Father. Christianity is, is unique in that our God is a deeply personal God. He's not distant. He's not that demanding master over us, but a God who loves us as a father and who calls us to love him too as his children. And just as I love that personal connection with my family, so God's people love to pray. Right? Do we? Do, we? do you? I think we know we should pray, but most of us end up really kind of shuffling our feet and mumbling a bit when we're asked to talk about our prayer life. It's never quite what it should be. And maybe part of that is because we've never been shown how to pray. And we're better to learn than from the Bible itself. Um, Jesus' supreme lesson is in Matthew chapter 6, the Lord's Prayer. 
But there are other uh, great prayers in the Bible, not the least of which the, the whole book of Psalms are pages and pages of examples of, of God's people in prayer, God's people's responses to him, uh, sometimes crying out in anguish, sometimes calling out in need, sometimes rejoicing in praise. It, it, it's all there in the book of Psalms. It's a good place, place to learn prayer. But then also there are passages like the one we're in today in Colossians 1, where Paul welcomes us into his prayer room. And what we find is a a man with real godly priorities, and these priorities shine through in his prayer. So let's have a look. What do we see when Paul prays? Well, first we see, if you look at verse 9, a constancy in prayer. It says, And so from the day we heard... We have not ceased to pray for you. So so since that day, Paul and we, he says, and his companions together haven't ceased to pray for the Colossians. So so Paul here is constant in his prayer, praying always. Now, I'm sure he doesn't mean that that's all he's done. It's not a literal, all I've done is pray from last month till now. But but what it does show is the ongoing nature of his prayer. It, it's not that he prayed once and then thought, you know, well, those people don't need, more, don't need any more prayer now. It seems obvious is that these people are constantly on his mind and that Paul is praying for them. And he has a system of daily prayer. He kept praying. And the Colossians, they were on that list. When, whenever he was praying, he was praying for the Colossians. Do you have a consistent pattern of prayer. See, lesson one in learning to pray is to pray. (laughs) Um, It's like years ago when I was at uni, I had the opportunity to choose an additional subject outside of the core subjects that I was doing, and I chose a French subject, a French class. I'd done a little bit of French in high school, and so I thought, well, maybe I'll give that a go. And, And it was an interesting class because it was just kind of kind of small, about maybe 20 students, and There was no textbook with vocab and French grammar lessons in it. We just had a teacher who came in and spoke French to us for a couple of hours at a time. And so as she spoke, she encouraged us to speak, to kind of imitate and to make conversation. And and in time, we started to pick it up. It was a bit terrible, I'm sure, at the very beginning, but in time, it got better. You see, see, the best way to learn how to speak French is to speak French, it's just a start. The best way to learn how to pray is to pray. Make a start, Uh, keep at it, and create a rhythm then for for your prayer. See, prayer is what we call a discipline of the Christian faith. It's something that God says we, we should do because through prayer, God's grace flows to us. We grow closer to God as we pray. When he invites us to pray, he's inviting us to have more of him. It is one of those channels through which God pours out his blessing for us. And yeah, look, there's effort in prayer, but it's a, it's a joyful effort. It brings us nearer to our Father who loves to hear us and loves to answer prayer. It's interesting how often we feel you know, God is distant from us, but generally that's the feeling of a person who's not praying. They're hoping God might act in some other kind of amazing way towards them. But in doing so, they're neglecting the very pathway that God has given that that leads directly to him. God says, here's the way. But for some reason, uh, we go looking for other ways. Now, another problem is when we misunderstand what prayer is for. Prayer is going to misfire for us if we primarily see it as a way to get gifts from God. First and foremost, prayer is about getting the giver. He's the treasure. We we want him as we pray. And the things that we might get from him are are just an added bonus. You see, prayer is, is relational. God draws us and we respond in prayer. So my first encouragement to you is to come with the right attitude and then to start praying. Find your best time, find a a good place, leave your dinging devices far away on silent somewhere. They can wait. Go undistracted to the throne room of God each day in prayer. And look, surely that's worth just trying for a week, right? Maybe you don't have that pattern of prayer. But what if you decided this week you'd commit to being constant in prayer every day with a notebook of things that you're going to 
to pray for, which we'll get to in a little bit. But start by simply enjoying God. Tell him why you love him. Tell him uh, why you're thankful to him. We, we looked at things to be thankful for last Sunday. And don't tell me you don't have time because we all make time for the things that are important to us. That's the threshold question here, isn't it? Is, is that relationship important to you that you would nurture it? Okay, so... Uh, what will we pray for? Well, Paul gives us some ideas here. And these are the things that, that he prays for his friends in the church at Colossae. Um, and I'd recommend you do the same, but include yourself in them. Pray, pray these things for yourself, but then also think about other Christian friends. Pray, pray for them as well. Maybe those in your home group or family members, even Christian missionaries. You don't have to, to know people personally to pray for them. Paul didn't know the believers at Colossae personally, but he still prayed these things for them. And the first thing he prays is that they would have a real insight into God's will. Verse 9 and it says that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And here we see that what's important for Paul, which is being aligned with God's will and purposes in the world, which is something that we get through spiritual wisdom and understanding. Now that kind of might sound to you as a little bit sort of mysterious, isn't it? But, but it's not really. Paul's not saying that he hopes that they learn certain hidden secrets that God has, that, that that's his will. That we often think of, of God's will as that mysterious thing that he knows about the future and that we somehow need to, to prize out of him to know what it is. You know, if I should take that job or, or is it God's will, will for me that I buy that house or that I go to Bible college? It's, it's like we think, well, God's holding out on us. And for a lot of people, in fact, they're quite paralyzed you know, without some clear sign from God about what we should go ahead and do. And is, is, that, is that the knowledge of God's will that Paul's asking for? I'm trying to work that out. We need to see how does the Bible talk about God's will? And what we find is that it's generally what it's talking about is either the perfect plan of God, which is his sovereign will. So meaning Paul says, you know, things like, I hope I can come to you by the will of God, or that, that he's been appointed as an apostle by the will of God. So that's God's sovereign plan for the way he's working in the world. That's one way. But the other way, and this is where I want to focus, is talking about things that are clear in the Bible that he wills for his people. For example, he wills that you should be transformed into the likeness of Jesus, Romans 12. That's the big thing, right? So it's not so much his will that you do something, but that you, you be something, that you be like Christ. Or it's his will, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, that you should be sanctified. Or 1 Thessalonians 5, be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you. The joyfulness, the prayerfulness, thankfulness. You see, God's not into keeping important secrets from you. He, he's already revealed to you the stuff that he wants you to do, how he wants you to be. The details about the gospel and about living lives that honor him and his concern in, in, in honoring and his concern in honoring him isn't that you should do a particular job or but that whatever job you're doing, you work with integrity and grace and kindness and that you demonstrate love and compassion. His will is your obedience. And so pray that. Pray that you and others would always pursue God's revealed will. Essentially, that you'd be aligned with God's plans and purposes in the world for you. That, that you'd be more and more like Jesus every day. And that people you know would be, be doing the same. Which leads to the second thing that he prays. And he prays, verse 10, that they would walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. It's a prayer for that they'd be godly, right? And that's linked, this second prayer is linked to the first. Notice that being filled with this knowledge of God's will leads to walking in a worthy way. The words so as to make that clear. He's asking God to fill them with the knowledge of his will so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Paul's are, Paul, pleasing God is 
is something we would love to do. Living lives that honour God is first and foremost on our minds. And then he explains, well, what does that look like? He paints a picture of, of this worthy life, of godliness. Now, four things stand out. And the first one is that we would be bearing fruit in every good work. And God's people demonstrate visible evidence of their changed lives. So while in other parts of the New Testament we'd, be, we'd say being fruitful includes character, the kinds of things we see in you know, the fruits of the Spirit, but here specifically Paul's talking about the works the Christian does. So, so, so pray about this, that, that the inner change would be manifested outward work in the way that you serve others and engage in ministries or the way that you, you pastor or teach people, the way that you use your gifts for the building up of the church, the, the way that you give generously towards church and mission, that the, the list goes on. These are the, the works that demonstrate your inner change. Pray that for yourself. Pray that for others. That as a church, we would be fruitful, working, building God's kingdom. And our second way, another way in which we can be godly is to increase in the knowledge of God. And importantly, what this means is, is knowing God relationally, not, not knowing about God intellectually, not knowing, you know, not knowing about God, but being drawn to a deeper understanding of him. I mean, we can learn, I could learn about Martin Luther King Jr., but not actually know him personally. The, the facts I learn will be helpful, but it's not a real knowledge of him. What Paul's praying is that we know God more deeply. A transformation will happen when you know God truly. Now, uh, understanding you know, God is, is part of that change process, isn't it? Learning about him from what he's shown us in his word, that's really important. But it's not, that's not all. The more is in your growing love for him, your growing joy in him, your, your worship of him. These things will, will increase as you walk with him. Now, third, Paul's looking for growing spiritual strength in God's people. Notice that verse 11, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. Now, it's interesting, isn't it? Implicit in that statement there is that you're going to need strength, that there'll be things to endure through. There are no promises of a smooth run through the Christian life. Things will get hard. Paul's prayer isn't to take that hard stuff away or even that they'd avoid it altogether. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? Because that's often my prayer. Remove the conflict, God, or take away the sickness, Father, fix what's broken. Now, I don't think those prayers are wrong, but they're not all. Paul's prayer is more about the attitude of the Christian in the face of the hard stuff. That our faith muscles would be strengthened so we can endure with patience. Uh, you know, for, for Paul, the miracle he wants to do, God wants God to do, isn't to, to give them a, a trouble-free life. The miracle is that they'd handle the trouble in such a way that shows their hope is in something different to everyone else. That they can depend on God for strength even when the hard stuff hits. Isn't that a refreshing prayer? It's a prayer to, to take note of. I mean, what, what have we prayed for today? We, you know, we pray for, uh, for COVID, people with COVID. Let's not just pray that the COVID goes away, but that those who suffer will be strengthened with all power, according to the glorious might for endurance and patience with joy. Pray for Ukraine. Let, let's pray for peace for sure, but let's also lift up the believers there that they too will be strengthened with all power according to God's glorious might for endurance and patience with joy. What, what a testimony that would be. Christians being calm, this calm, non-anxious non -anxious presence, serving the suffering and anxious in their communities in Ukraine. Finally, uh, thankfulness. Walking in a worthy manner is being thankful. Now, we talked about this last week, but, it, but it's so good. It's a good reminder, isn't it, to be thankful people. Paul's heart moves directly towards thankfulness for the gospel. Saying, look, here, look at what God's done. He's, verse 12, he's qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. 
You've been given an inheritance. You know, God's blessings are yours. There's, there's nothing lacking, nothing that you need that you don't already have. And it's all yours from God. And he's delivered you from the domain of darkness, verse 13, and into the kingdom of Jesus. He transferred you there. So God's literally you know, picked you up from the dark room of sin and death and he's put you into the shining, glorious room of the kingdom of Jesus. And notice that that's, he's not talking about a future thing. It's done. He's already delivered you. He's already transferred you. You are in the light with Jesus, who is the light of the world. And this has happened because God has redeemed you and forgiven you of your sin. Again, past tense, done, accomplished in Christ. Find it interesting the number of times you hear people say you know, that they're thankful for something or parents telling their children to be thankful. But it's usually an imperative that has no, no object, no target. See, thankfulness needs a person, right? We are thankful to God for his grace to us, ever thankful and ever prayerful. It was more than 10 years ago now that I did a, a Christian leadership development course over a two-year period uh, called, called Arrow, and it involved a cohort of about 30 leaders from all over Australia. And, and the Arrow team you know, who led all this was a pretty you know, impressive lineup of some really influential Christian leaders in Australia. Uh, the people who taught us were some of you know quite expert in their fields as Christians. But as the two years was coming to an end, we had a session where uh, they brought out a lady who's, who they said was arguably the most important part of the Arrow leadership team. Who was she? She wasn't a Bible teacher. She wasn't a leadership trainer. She wasn't a personal mentor for young leaders. She wasn't even the administrator who kept everything humming. Who was she? Well, she was a retired school teacher who had gone blind. But she didn't let that stop her. She turned this into an opportunity to pray. And she made it her ministry to pray. And hundreds of graduates from the Arrow program uh, men and women in Christian ministries all over, well, all over the world would send her, the invitation was to send her things for which she could pray. And she serves them and their ministries through her prayers. She loves them, though she may not even know them, but she loves them through prayer. What an incredible ministry. And you know, it's a ministry any one of us could replicate. When we pray, we bring ourselves near to the God who can, near to the God who will, and near to the God who does. I'll leave you with some words from Oswald Chambers, who puts it well when he says, prayer does not fit us for the greater work. Prayer is the greater work. So let's pray now. Oh, gracious Father, forgive us that we have neglected the greater work. The work of sitting before you in prayer. Or as Paul describes it even in Colossians, his struggle in prayer. Well, might it be that we have that kind of attitude? Not just small little arrow prayers. Not inattention, but giving great attention to you. Father, train our hearts to desire you more, to want to be near the giver, and to then see the wonderful gifts that you bring. Might we come with thankfulness? Might we come with open hearts before you that you would be the one who would work change in us as we pray? Or might it not be that we come wanting to change you, but just being willing to see the change that you would bring in the world in the lives of others, and especially in our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, thanks for joining us today. We pray now that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit would be with you all. Amen.